Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Pit Mailbag Show here with the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, where your Pit beat writers, Christopher Carter and Stephen Thompson. As always, you can find the show every Tuesday on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this channel to get all of those episodes, as well as the daily content that comes out from all of our Pittsburgh sports writers, including the Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of the North Shore Drive podcast. But it's been a busy, busy time in pit athletics. While pit football has been taking some beatings and dropped to seven and three after starting seven and zero, pit basketball still undefeated after a very strong win over West Virginia on on uh, Friday. We are recording this before they take on Virginia Military Institute Monday night, so. Uh, that is not in our register as far as what has happened. But we took a lot of your questions via via social media and via email. Remember, you can always hit us up either on Twitter, Blue Sky, wherever, or just email our Post Gazette accounts, and we will try to get your questions answered on the show. We start off with football here because Pitt football dropped a tough one to Clemson. We did our post game show from there from Accenture Stadium. And we have a question on Twitter, or from X, excuse me. Uh, WVU has never won the Big 12, asks legitimate question if they lose out and finish seven and five is narduzzi on the hot seat i doubt the new ad would be thrilled with that of course new ad being alan green uh pitt starting off seven and zero, losing five losing five straight would be pretty disappointing uh however um looking looking at that uh steven how would would, would narduzzi be on the hot seat i think it would it would dark it would take away the shine that he brought this season because I think that there was a little bit of questions coming into the season at three and nine and then there's seven no it's like okay all those questions have gone away but now those questions might slightly return but I, I point to this for people that don't remember Pat Andrews signed an extension in 2022 after Pitt won the ACC championship and his salary before that extension was like 4.8 million a year Pitt couldn't buy out Jeff Capel when he had like three years left in this deal. I find it very hard for Pitt with the all the reporting we've done on Victory Heights, on the house settlement, on NIL, that they're going to also want to throw money into buying out their head coach, who, by the way, just had his third winning season in the last four years, uh, regardless of if, if they lose out. And again, that's a hypothetical at this point. But I, I have a hard time finding them, uh, seeing Pitt find the money to get rid of Pat, to chase out Pat and Arduzzi while needing to address these other issues. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely agree with you. I think you're 100% right about the buyout, um, but also um, the hard football of it. it you know, I, I think the perception of this season is more negative than maybe it actually is. You know, I think fans are more down right now than um, – I'm not going to say than they should be because three-game losing streak is three-game losing streak, and the way Pitt has right. lost to these three games has been pretty devastating. Um, but – you know, I, I think we'd all feel very different if they started the season five and two, or you know, even six and one, or something like that. Um, and then took, you know, a, at least had one loss to or one win to break up this this three game losing streak. Um, we got to remember that they they won three games last year. I mean, they have already improved and, and exceeded expectations uh, for this year. Um, I don't think I don't necessarily necessarily subscribe to the idea that. Um, you know, you change expectations uh, throughout the season, or that you, um, or that you, you know, uh, I guess you can change expectations throughout the season, but I don't think this is a scenario where you do do that. I think Pitt played, you know, a lighter schedule in the first half of the year, and they faced some harder teams in the back half. Like most of their expected losses were going to come in this second half. We knew that from the beginning um, of the season. So um, I still. You know, I hesitate to call this season successful, um, but it's, you know, an improvement off of what they were last year. And that com combined with the fact that Pitt would have to buy out a pretty hefty contract from Pat Narduzzi, tell me that even if his seat does get a little bit warmer, it's not going to be anything resembling hot. Yeah, I think if if anything, it's a it's a, it's a lukewarm seat at this uh, you know at, at, at that point. And again, they got to lose the last two games. They almost beat a ranked team in Clemson. Uh, this past weekend, if they had won that game, I think that tones changed entirely. Louisville just lost a, lost a heartbreaker uh, to a really not good Stanford team. So who knows? Anything can happen on any given Saturday. Uh, and they finish up against Boston College. So we'll see how things play out there. We move along to TD412 crew, also on X, who asks, have you noticed that after Virginia, Narduzzi with 10 years of losing big games, many at home, really took some shots at offensive coordinator Cade Bell? Um, Steven. I feel like there's times where things get said and they they can be taken one way. I do feel like there's times we, I mean we've I've covered it when Pat Narduzzi's you know kind of thrown Mark Whipple under the bus 
Um, and and in, even in years when Mark Whipple's offense was the very thing carrying Pitt, I don't think he's done that yet to Cade Bell. I do think that if you're someone that's who's looking for it, he has certainly left some breadcrumbs for you to at least ask the questions if he's doing it. But I don't think he's crossed that line just yet. Yeah, I, I mean, well, look, the the thing is that Cade Bell does deserve a little bit of criticism, you know, and as his head coach, as his boss, uh, even if he maybe shouldn't do it publicly. Uh, I think Pat Narduzzi's got to be critical of his offensive coordinator when he's struggling at this point. Um, he was critical of himself following that Virginia game and the Clemson game too. Um, you know, saying he took some shots at Cade Bell, I mean, I think that's kind of a subjective term. I mean, Agreed. you have to be critical of your team when they lose and they lose in that fashion. So um, is that necessarily taking shots? I mean, I think that has uh, that implies that, you know, some of the criticism wasn't deserved, and I think it is. So – I don't know if he was necessarily taking shots. I think he was off. He was offering some, some valid criticism. I think he had some expectations for what Cade Bell would be able to do, and uh, he had some expectations for this offense that this offense had, quite frankly, created for itself. And um, that offense wasn't meeting those standards. So um, Narduzzi was critical. He was critical of himself too. I will repeat that. It's not like he has absolved himself of yeah. blame. Um, but you know, he was asked questions about the offense, and he's got to answer them. Uh, so those answers aren't going to be positive during a time like this. And I wouldn't necessarily call it uh, taking shots uh, at K bell at this point. And I also think if, if the biggest shots that Pat Narduzzi is given right now has been personnel wise about, Hey, we, mm-hmm. we didn't have another Branson Taylor. We, he said, we, you know, we, he brought up free agency about going and getting offensive linemen. I think there's a full acknowledgement that like Pitt's offensive line has been bad this year and it's got, and it's gotten worse with the injury that they've had to sustain this year. So if anything, I think that Pat Narduzzi, like you said, if there's some frustrations with disagreements between him and Cade Bell, I think that they're minimal so far. And I don't think that these are big things just yet. And again, these things happen, like you said, when losses happen and there's blame to go around and you're addressing things, you know, everyone sh- everyone shares in the blame just like they share in the success. Um, but um, I don't think Pat Narduzzi has really taken shots at Cade Bell just yet. Now, again, we've seen him take real shots at people before. Right. But these these have been more like, hey, we're cleaning things up, we're figuring things out. Let's see how this season continues and how things go move forward into next year. Because uh, if Cade Bell sticks around, which we assume he will, um, and Pitt's offense returns to, to returns to what it was the early part of this season, or takes a step forward, or things, then we'll get to see how does how does Pat Narduzzi handle those moments. We'll see all that playing out moving forward. Last question on football before we switch to basketball. Elijah emailed us. Should Pitt consider leaving one of their OL backups, either Ter- Terrence Enos, Jackson Brown, or Isaiah Montgomery, in for the last couple of weeks to build chemistry? And, of course, this coming because Pitt's offensive line has just been decimated with injuries from Ryan Jacoby to Branson Taylor to Lyndon Cooper. I mean, that's basically the entire left side of the line. They've all been injured. There's other guys who have been injured, too. Um I think what's going to have to happen here, Steven, is someone's going to have to be in because too many people are hurt right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your options for rotating those guys are are pretty limited now. But I do kind of think that they should consider, at least consider, leaving one of those backups in for a longer period of time just because I I look at all the procedural penalties that they had in the last game, um, all the communication issues. um, None of these guys are necessarily separating themselves for their technique um, or anything of that nature. So I believe it's probably in Pitt's best interest to – take a shot at who they think the most talented or the highest upside one of that group is and let them work for longer periods of time with their, uh, with that unit so that they can develop some, some chemistry, because that's the other thing is you're going to have guys moving on after this year and one or more of Enos and Jackson Brown and Isaiah Montgomery are going to have to step up and probably be starters next year, assuming, uh, you know, Pitt's probably going to have to go into the portal to get some guys too, but uh, these are going to be at the very least backups or guys who are contending for starting jobs. So um, you can kind of do a little bit of both and uh, have, have it both ways and try to find your most talented guy while also maybe having an eye towards the future too. Um, the other thing is they're going to have a few weeks of bowl practices too at the end of this year that they can test yeah. some of these guys out in. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing here is chemistry is important. Um, I, and like your point too, and like we've been talking about, I also wouldn't be shocked if, they bring in a whole bunch of new offensive linemen next year that, that, that starts. So um, look at the young guys, fi- maybe find someone. I agree, you know, test, test your guys right now, see who they are. Um, but, you know, also protect your quarterbacks because yeah. uh, Nate Yarnell got sacked eight times and hit a lot more than that. You don't want him to take that kind of abuse. It shouldn't just be, oh, we're experimenting. It should be, 
no, no, no. You're going out here to win, and right. you're going out here to protect guys. And if you can get young guys' experience, great. But you got to protect your quarterback, and you got to uh, come in with a plan on the offensive line. Let's switch to basketball, where things are a lot more on the upswing. There, Jub Jub on Blue Sky asks, "Why didn't Capel close the deal with some of the big recruits over the last few weeks? You've seen Derek Dixon, Amari Evans, and now Malik Thomas. None of them chose Pitt." Uh, Stephen, you're our, you are our recruitment guy. You write at the recruitment report every every Friday. What's your what's your make of Pitt not landing any of these really big names? Yeah, there's it's a little obvious at some points. Like, you know, Dixon committed to UNC, Amari Evans committed to Tennessee, and Malik Thomas committed to Arkansas and John Cal Perry. So Thomas, I mean, I'm sure he got quite a bit of money from from Arkansas and you know the the Tyson Food Corporations who seems to be backing their NIL program down there in uh in Fayetteville. But um, you know, Evans chose to play for Rick Barnes, who's a really outstanding coach, and Evans is a much more defensive minded guy, so he's going to play for a defensive coach and a defensive program in Tennessee and Dixon. I mean, the allure of North Carolina, a blue bud program. I mean, that's pretty hard to deny as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I hate to be reductive like that, but sometimes brand power does win out like that. And sometimes money does win out like that. I think the flip side of this though, is, you know, you look at a guy like Amari Evans, who is fast rising a little bit underrated um, is a good athlete kind of fits the profile of a guy like a Bob Carrington, um, a guy who's, was a little underrated during the recruiting process, clearly, um, mm -hmm. and uh, blossomed into something really, really good at Pitt. So, um, you know, Jeff Capel told us, I guess it was last week, that he doesn't really chase stars. And I don't think he, you know, I don't think he gets as disappointed anymore when one of these guys maybe chooses these highly rated guys that he does pursue because, you know, it tends to be that the highly rated guys are the most talented guys um, and the best players. Uh, when they choose a blue blood school like that over Pitt, I think he understands the position that Pitt is in. He wants to win these battles, but um, I think he understands when he loses them and knows that you know when he recruits players and when he does land guys, he has faith in his ability to develop them as well. So, um, you know, saying yeah, Capel did not close the deal on these guys and he was recruiting them for a long time. You know, especially in Evans and Thomas's cases, they were in his own backyard, but. Sometimes you just lose out to the bigger kid on the block, and uh, I don't think that's necessarily news to anyone, uh, even if it's disappointing. No, I, I agree. I think that that's – I think something to remember for Pitt fans, as good as Pitt fans are feeling because of back-to-back 20-plus -back win seasons, feeling that they should have been in the tournament last year, two tournament wins the year before that, Pitt is still not – back to being one of the best programs in the country, like like consistently in and out the way they were in the Jamie Dixon era. And if Jeff Cable can get them back to that, like like this year, let them make the Sweet 16, and then a Sweet 16 after that, and then maybe an Elite Eight at some point, then I think Jeff Cable starts to enter more of those conversations. Because then you're also getting more money, you're getting more attention, you get more national attention, you're getting more draw, and people are all saying, hey, I can maybe even win a national championship here. I think that's what Pitt has to get back to. They have to keep winning. They have to keep doing more. And then uh, maybe some of those bigger recruits will, will pick Pitt over some of those other blue bloods that, that we talked about there. So lots to get, lots, but and still lots to, lots to wait and see because, like you said, Jeff Capel's done really well with some guys that have been overlooked, uh, been really talented, and then they turned out to be pretty good players. Let's see what they do with this crew and how that influences things moving forward. Yeah. And I would also add that, I mean, I wrote about this in my recruitment report last week. I mean, they, haven't offered. I mean, there aren't a ton of guys left in the high school ranks that they have offered who haven't committed yet. So it's not like the Panthers, after they've missed out on guys like Thomas or Evans or Dixon, have started chasing after other high school recruits. Right. I think this next class is going to be pretty portal heavy. Um, I think they're going to look for some experience, especially at the guard spot when you've got you know Brandon Cummings and then Witherspoon coming in. Mm -hmm. um, you're losing Leggett. Um, and Damian Dunn, you are likely to lose Jalen Lowe. Um, I would still guess at this point uh, he might be an NBA draft candidate. So um, don't need to panic over losing these guys. I understand it's frustrating um, if you're a Pitt fan, but um, I think good things are still coming, and Jeff Capel has certainly proven he knows how to recruit the transfer portal. Certainly has. Let's talk about some of the games they got coming up, though, because that's what everyone's looking at where they play military mid uh, military Virginia Military Institute, or VMI, tonight. Uh, after we record this show, um, Pitt's got Pitt's got an interesting slate coming up because after that they hit the road. They go to the Greenbrier Tournament. Well, I'll be covering that live uh, LSU two thirty Friday, and then 
Uh, they have a Sunday game against either Wisconsin or UCF. So Brandon emailed us and asked, how many wins does Pitt need to get during its five-game stretch against Power Conference teams, teams to be a success? Because this next five-game stretch is going to play into their non-conference strength of schedule and their non-conference performance, which does play a big factor into the committee's decisions, as we saw last year. Uh, and again, Pitt plays LSU to start the Greenbrier tournament. The second game will be either UCF or Wisconsin. Then after that, they'll be on the road in Ohio State. I'll be there covering that. After that, they're on the road for Mississippi State. I believe you're covering that one, Stephen. Um unless I mix that up and then they and then they uh, have another one against Virginia Tech before they play Eastern Kentucky and Sam Houston before uh, they get back to full they, they start their full ACC schedule there. So right there five five games um, of those of those teams, only Ohio State is a ranked opponent, which proposes that that, that could be a huge game. Steven, I don't know about you. I feel like it would be reasonable for Pitt to go three and two during this stretch and say they did an all right job. But knowing what we knew know from last year, I almost feel like they have to go four and one to kind of prove a point about non-conference strength of schedule and prove a point about how they performed non-conference so that they can keep the doubt out of their out of their resume. And they live, they said, leave no doubt is the is the message of the season. I think if you're a leave no doubt type of team, you need to be able to beat these these non these power these power conference not non conference teams. Yeah, it does help that Wisconsin actually did climb into the rankings this week after really mm -hmm. dominating Arizona um, over the weekend. So they had a really huge win. They will be ranked when if Pitt plays them. But that's kind of the 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 way it flips for me. Um, I think my first instinct was to say three and two as well. Um, especially, I think. You definitely need to beat LSU and Virginia yeah. Tech. Those aren't particularly quality power conference teams. Um, but then I think Wisconsin, Ohio State, and Mississippi State, those are all teams that uh, could reasonably be considered top 25 teams. I think they're all top 30 uh, in the Ken Palm rankings. Um, UCF is a little different. Um, I would say that that's a team Pitt should definitely beat. Um, but if they can steal one off of Wisconsin, Ohio State, and Mississippi State, well, beating LSU and Virginia Tech, I'd consider that a success. But if you throw UCF in the mix instead of Wisconsin, I would say you definitely need to go four and one against them. Um, you do make a really good point, though. If you are a leave no doubt team, which Pitt wants to be this year, uh, you really need to go four and one. Um, it does help that these games are also on the road as well. I mean, if Pitt does drop or on the road or at a neutral site, so if Pitt does drop one of these, um, then you know their their net ranking eventually, whenever that comes out, I'm not exactly sure when the first net rankings hmm. drop, but uh, those will not suffer as badly or those losses won't look nearly as bad. I think most of these, if not all of them would be considered quad one games um, by the time they, by the time Pitt plays them. So um, wins or losses uh, still better that Pitt has kind of scheduled this way and scheduled some tough teams like this. I think it's going to be interesting last year. I mean, people forget when they, when they played Missouri and uh, in West Virginia, those were two tournament teams in the year before they just crashed out badly. Right. Uh, and, and that was just something they, they could not avoid Pitt needs. And it's funny after, after Pitt beat West Virginia, uh, Jeff Capel was be sure to say, Hey, we hope they win the rest of their games because <laughs> that makes them look better now. Uh, but that's kind of what you hope for is that, you know, you want Pitt to come in, win these games, you also need these guys, these teams that they beat to also end up being decent to good teams. Um, so it doesn't hurt your net rankings or your non-conference strength strength of schedule, but handle your business and you don't got to worry about it anyways. Because if you just if you beat them all, then no one can say nothing about you. But still, a lot to see here uh, for pit football and pit basketball. We will have you covered all week long. We're gonna we're getting ready to head over to the Pete uh, to cover Pit Beat versus VMI, and then uh, throughout the rest of this week, you'll get our coverage leading up to both Pitt's first game in the Greenbrier tournament against LSU and as well as Pitt Louisville, where Pitt football tries to rebound and stop its three game skid. Steven will be covering that one in Louisville. Your team is going to be on the road a lot. And there's also lots of action that Abby Schnabel's covering between uh, soccer and volleyball in there and their dom dominance. Lots of exciting times here for Pitt athletics. Get all that coverage at the Pittsburgh post Gazette post gazette.com from Chris Carter and Steven Thompson. Thanks again for tuning into the Pitt mailbag show. We'll see you again later this week as we're covering all the Live pit events. Thank you for checking out this content from Post Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com. <laughs>